Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the gathering. Thank you. One clap. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. If I have not gotten the chance to meet you yet, my name is Keila Smith. I work in our student life office here on campus and have worked in campus ministry for a long time, and it's really, really good to be with you guys today. Um, welcome to the gathering. For those of you who may have not heard at this point, today is Founders Day. It's a very, very special day for us to celebrate um, our history, our heritage, our founder, David Lipscomb, today together. We have lots and lots of surprises and special things for you in store today. So we're very excited that you're here. We're excited to break excited to celebrate together. Um, I'm going to introduce a quick video about just David Lipscomb, the history of our university, and kind of where things really got started back on the actual founding day. So we're very excited. We're glad you're here. Um, happy Founders Day to everyone, and we'll go ahead and play the video. October 5th, 1891 is Founders Day at Lipscomb. It's the day that the school has started, now 125 years ago. But what's with that? Why would there be any value in taking a day each year to honor its namesake? It's been 125 years, and David Lipscomb is long gone. But his footprint is not. Yes, perhaps those footprints have become harder to detect by the years, but they remain. Recently, two Lipscomb historians met in this old Lipscomb cabin on campus to talk about the man. Dr. Howard Miller is the current chair of the Department of History, Politics, and Philosophy. And Dr. Robert Hooper is the longest serving head of the university's history department, and who, through his research and writing, has come as close to meeting David Lipscomb as anyone on this side of the grave. So, through them, feel the spirit of the man whose life and loves set this university on its path. They opened the school out on faith because very little money had been raised. There was nothing. The three faculty members did not have any promise of any uh, salary. And so on that first day, uh, nine students showed up. Three teachers, uh, James A. Harding, William Lipscomb, and David Lipscomb were the three teachers. And so, uh, but now throughout the year, uh, other students would come and um, upwards of uh, 30 students would, would come and be a part of the student body, including some, some young ladies. Uh, several years later, before Lipscomb died, he was, um, he was sorry that uh, they had chosen the name of the Nashville Bible School because too many people thought it was just a school for preachers. And it has never been a school for preachers. It's always been a liberal arts school. I heard the tuition was, was it $3 a week? Oh, yeah, something like that. It was it was three, I think it was $3 it, a week. It was almost, almost nothing. Yeah. Almost nothing. And, and I also wanted to say that they, uh, they had a rabbi uh, they teaching came, classes they, within the second year or something. Yeah. Who uh, taught Hebrew. Taught Hebrew. Interesting. <laughs> Well, a lot shaped David Lipscomb before his school opened when he was 60, beginning with his family's acceptance of what we now call Restoration Christianity. After his family heard Alexander Campbell preach in Kentucky, it led them to do something that was thought extreme, even illegal at the time. And one of the things that came out of their study of the Bible was that slavery is not biblical. And uh, so as a result, uh, they decided they, they were going to free their slaves. But Tennessee would not allow freedom of slaves. They had an exclusion act that if you freed your slaves, you had to remove them out of the state. And so they decided, well, all right, if that's the case, then we'll go to Illinois and free our slaves. Um, they could not uh, free them without paying a, a, a large sum of money, upwards to $1,000 per slave. And they didn't have that kind of money because they had just spent their money in buying land. And so, um, so this, put, this put them in a quandary. And eventually they will free the slaves over in Indiana. So Lipscomb was best known as a publisher and a writer, and is said to have been involved in one controversy after the next in his writing. But his preaching style was just as controversial. An officer was sent to hear Lipscomb preach to see, see whether or not he was um, um, loyal to the Confederacy. And Nathan Bedford Forrest was the one who sent this, this officer. And this officer came to hear Lipscomb preach. And um, when he was over, he went back and told uh, Forrest, he said, he's, um, uh, I don't know whether he's loyal to the Confederacy or not, but he's loyal to the Bible. 
Yes, the Civil War was a central turning point in David Lipscomb's life. He not only tried to preach through it on both sides, but he also met and married Miss Margaret Selner during the war. He was what we might call today a community organizer who worked to petition the Union to exempt Christians from military service. So when the war was, uh, was over, not only was he against war, he was against participation in government. Mm -hmm. That government is secular. And it's, it was this, uh, this was his uh, move then toward a change in theology that uh, he became an advocate of the kingdom of God as opposed to the kingdoms of this world. And the Christian was held, oh, held um, had his allegiance, should have his allegiance to the kingdom of God. During the years following the Civil War, a middle-aged Lipscomb continued to act out of his faith regardless of public opinion. For example, Nashville was hit by two cholera epidemics, the bigger one in 1873. But Lipscomb's heart and his faith led him to dive into meeting community needs in some very remarkable ways for the times. While others were fleeing it as fast as they could go, they were actually uh, adding new cars onto the trains to, to handle the people to get out of the city to escape the cholera. And so Lipscomb remained, he and, um, and the Robertson Association, the young, young men from Churches of Christ and so forth, literally went into the houses of the, especially the black communities, to feed the people, to clean the houses, and, and try to save their lives. And this is where the story of the Catholic nuns come in because they didn't have transportation. And so Lipscomb provided his buggy as transportation uh, for these nuns, and so he would drive them wherever they wanted to go to get to the needy people. And of course, Lipscomb was a major influence in the development of the Church of Christ during those years, struggling with many of the big issues of that day. Here's one. Such issues as um, the music and worship, it took him a long time to finally make up his mind on such issues as that. Uh, he finally decided that, well, um, a cappella music is the best and the, and the way to go uh, for Christians. And the reason he took him so long was he was basically tone deaf. <laughs> tone deaf. And he did not want to make his decision based on his tone deafness. Lipscomb's founder was not only a pacifist and an enlightened thinker on race, but he was what we would call a feminist today. The first class at Nashville Bible School had three female students in it, which was very unusual for the day. And it got better. In 1915, 1916, half of the faculty were made up of women. That's right. I, I, I knew that. I, I'd seen the picture. Yeah. You wouldn't find many college universities that age having that many women unless it was a, a woman's school. So this is a little of what the founder of this university and academy was all about. In many ways, a man before his time, a man who today might have led a service day project or a mission trip, a man who would have challenged thinking on social issues. He is honored on Founders Day because of his faith, because of his strength in standing up against the wrongs in racism and war, because of his sense of respect in the face of strong disagreement, and because of his deep commitment to community even when it threatened his health and life. He was never president, but he was always the leader. He never heard the term David Lipscomb College. It was actually renamed after his death, and he likely would not have been pleased. <laughs> and perhaps most important, while his vision was expansive, he likely never dreamed what it was to become, thanks to his footprints. Well, good morning. Every day when I walk up the steps at Christman, about halfway up the landing there, there's a picture of David Lipscomb. And every day when I walk up there, I wonder, are we doing what he would have had in mind? He has a fairly stern look on his face, and he's got small wire glasses and kind of a scuffy beard. Uh, he really was a man from a different time, and yet, 125 years later, we gather here to celebrate his dream, his vision, his sense of commitment, and his sense that there was something with great purpose to be done in this city. 
Let me take you somewhere else for just a moment. I want you to go with me to Orlando, Florida. The year is 1971. Walt Disney had created Disneyland in Southern California and opened in 1955, but he had a larger vision. He had a sense that he could do it again and do it even better. He was trying to create, as they call it, the happiest place on earth. Unfortunately, Walt Disney died in 1966, and Disney World in Florida did not open until 1971. The story is told that the day before the park opened, the executives for Disney were walking down Main Street, and as they were walking down Main Street, uh, they were talking about that particular moment, and one of them turned to another and said, you know, it's really too bad that Mr. Disney isn't here. He couldn't imagine what we built. Well, someone else responded to him and said, no, no, that's not right. That's not right at all. If he hadn't imagined it, we wouldn't be here. And in a sense, that's the way it is with our university. If he hadn't imagined it 125 years ago, it wouldn't be here. And we wouldn't be a part of this great educational enterprise uh, that shapes lives for the future, that affects our community, that literally has an impact on the world. I, I was trying to figure out how do we get back to 1891? How do we go back 125 years, even in this moment, as we pause to think and to celebrate and to be appreciative and grateful? And I was thinking about the contrast and, and perhaps the difficulty he would have had imagining who we are today. Uh, in 1891, milk was about 21 cents a gallon. Butter was 24 cents. A dozen eggs were about 27 cents. How could he have imagined that 125 years later, we would spend, well, 16 times what it costs for a gallon of milk on a cup of coffee in Starbucks? How could he have imagined that students would line up all day long to spend what was a quarter of a week's wages for a cup of coffee? Or the fellowship that would come with that, or, or the sense of energy that we have when we're there standing in line? The rules for basketball were not really finalized till 1892, a year after he established the school. So could he have ever imagined that his school would have a Division I athletic program, play in a conference that extends from Florida to New Jersey, have over 300 Division I athletes? How could he have imagined that? In his time, travel from the United States to Italy uh, well, actually, the record was broken when one ship carrying passengers made it in seven days, 16 hours, and 22 minutes. And yet, I'll be in Italy later this week with our students who are studying in Florence, and, and they tell me my flight from Atlanta to Rome will be just a little over nine hours. Or could he even imagine that this university would, would not just have a campus in Green Hills, but it would be in Florence, and it would be in London, and it would be in Santiago, and it would be literally dozens and dozens of other places around a world that he had no possibility of ever visiting. You know, a hundred years ago, we were not called Music City, USA. Could he have imagined that somehow this particular city where he established this college would become the focal point of music in our country? Uh, that at Lipscomb University, the cowboy show would be a signature event in the fall. And the people like Kelsey Ballerini and others would come out of this program onto a national stage. Could Lipscomb have ever imagined that? Could he have imagined in that particular time where going to medical school was really a very new thing? In fact, most physicians never went to college. Uh, they studied with someone else, and in most parts of the country, they didn't even need a license to practice. Could he have imagined, looking forward 125 years, that this university would be named as the number one University among all 280 Christian colleges in terms of our biology program. And out of that program and the sophistication there 
would be doctors and nurses and dentists and vets, and the list would go on in healthcare. Could he have imagined? Could he have imagined when those nine students gathered in that small room at some place downtown that someday his university would have uh, essentially 6,000 students in the university and the academy? And they would come not just from Nashville and not just from Middle Tennessee, but they would come from 48 states and 50 or 60 foreign countries. Could he have imagined? Could he have imagined that in the shadow of what was still a very young Vanderbilt University, his small school would eventually grow up and in this year, 2016, would be moved by Carnegie from a regional master's school to a national research university, and not only be moved to that category, but be put in the top of the two tiers in that category, and now would be among the top three or four percent of all the universities in America. Could he have imagined that? Could he have imagined as uh, the students gathered that day and, and literally tied up their horses somewhere outside so they could go into class that someday students would drive cars? Uh, Benz had just six years before that invented the gas gasoline engine. Uh, could he have imagined that a university would need 1,500, maybe 2,000 parking spaces for the cars the students would bring and have the wealth in order to bring them? And I did check this morning, when you come back from spring break, the first 57 of our new parking spaces will be done. <laughs> so could he have imagined, and my sense is he probably could not have imagined, that even if he was Walt Disney-like and did his very best in Imagineering, David Lipscomb couldn't have figured out what this would be. But as I walk up those stairs and I look him in the eye every day, I hope and I believe that what has happened would be something, well, that he would support and he would be proud of. The one thing he could imagine, while he might have missed on technology and the developments in our world and all kinds of sophisticated things, the one thing he would have imagined was you. He would have imagined that at his school, there would be young people who would come and invest this time in their lives, and they would do two things. They would prepare themselves for their careers. It was a liberal arts university from the very beginning. And they would prepare themselves with character and faith that they then would take into their lives. He never knew you, and yet in a remarkable way, he had a relationship and an understanding, and an imagination, and you are the fulfillment of it. And so on this day, we pause. On this day, as a university community, we pause, and we pause to just say, we are part of a living legacy. We are part of a, a tremendously important history. And we pause to think about the one who had that vision 125 years ago. He might have stayed up late in that little cabin that's on our campus. He might have talked to his friends about what could happen. He and John Harding had the courage to then move forward. And doing all of that, thought about how they might, 125 years later, affect your life. We are greatly appreciative. We are very humble. And we recognize that we are the beneficiaries of tremendous blessing. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for this time where we can pause and think about those who we'll never know but who imagined us. Those who were courageous and visionary. Those who had a sense of what could be done and were committed to doing it. Thank you for David Lipscomb and Margaret. Thank you for John Harding. Thank you for the hundreds and hundreds of faculty over the years who have, have been those who have nurtured our students. Thank you for the 13 other university presidents and the many board members. And thank you most of all, Father, for students. For those that have said, I want to entrust part of my life to you. 
I want to be on a journey with you. I want to be in a story with you. Allow us to be the community that you call us to be. Allow us to see clearly the mission you call us to. And allow us to be in relationship with you as you have called us. In Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Lowry. And as part of a university community that's in its 125th year, we have a lot of really cool things that happen around here. Uh, Dr. Lowry's got a special announcement that you'll be very interested in after our, our next guest. But part of being a community like this is there are a lot of very positive things that go on. And one is the good work of uh, one of our Bible faculty members, Dr. Lee Camp, and the Tokens program. And uh, they're going to actually have a Tokens program tonight on campus, and, and you'll hear a little bit more about that. But as a result of that, we've got a special guest that's going to uh, kind of start part of our Founders Day celebration for us. Uh, would you welcome Michael Gunger to the stage, and you're going to have the opportunity. He's gonna, you're going to have the opportunity to have a private concert. <laughs> and uh, a little taste of what would happen in tokens tonight. And then after uh, Michael shares with us, uh, Dr. Lowry has a couple of special announcements. tall a painted smile across your face I prayed for heaven prayed for grace I gave my life when I was ten my life when I was ten prayed in tongues was born again and it's always ever been you you were there as the world unfolded harsher fair as the spiral paired the seams and the brand new colors gleams I would only think of you Savior, Lord, and King, oh, my friend, and everything, it was always only you. I saw the writing on the wall. You were a man, and that was all. There was no God in heaven above. I saw no perfect saving love. Always only ever me. It was always only me.
torn apart I felt a ground, I felt a heart And all the universe was one Like a father, spirit, son My heart is open once again a Distant love, a forlorn friend Maybe it's always ever been you. And if you are there, as the world unfolds its harsher fare, as the spiral pairs the seams and the holy haunts my dreams, I will stay right here with you. Whoa. Every broken heart and tangled care Jesus, teacher, I'm right Son of God and source of light It's always only you It's always only you Well, good morning. It's so nice to be with you guys. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm just going to do a couple of songs here. This next one is, uh, if you were paying attention to the lyrics of the last song or any of the music that we've written over the years in my band, Gunger, um, I've written a lot about doubt and sort of my own journey through the years. I kind of, I grew up as a pastor's kid and and in church and learned how to play music in church and and then went through like a long deconstruction where I sort of questioned everything and had to sort of brick by brick tear everything down uh, to figure out what I really believed about stuff and looked searching for the truth. And um, a few years ago, I finally came to this place where I couldn't, I kind of removed the last brick and was like, I, I guess I don't believe anything. Um, and then after that, it was like, uh, for me in my journey, I felt like I had, I had to go through that um, to get to this place where, because I'm a kind of person that I, I have to control everything and I have to like figure things out, right? I, I have to, I, I want to I understand things. It's part of my ego structure. And, I, and, and God is not a concept that is easily parsed or um, dissected or uh, containable within a construct, right? So, um, and so I felt like I had to kind of cut all of it out, sort of like a tumor or something, that it was after that point that I was finally able to come back to some practice because I... I'd had experiences with God, and I, there was experiences in my life that I couldn't shake, even as I was able to shake my beliefs. I was like, there's something to my experience. I was never able to fully let go of, like, or fully, I never wrote off all, you know, religious experiences as harmful, because I knew what it had done for me and people in my life. Um, so I was missing it, kind of being post, being able to believe anything, and kind of tiptoed back into mystery, um, and some Eastern Orthodox thoughts kind of helped me the way they approach language versus how kind of the Western rational reduction, reductionistic mind often approaches words like God and tries to like really figure it out, put bullet points on it. Um, and so this, this was the first song that I was able to write about God post-deconstruction. And it actually had started years before that, but I never was able to finish it. I feel like I had to really come to the edge of fully having hands open where I didn't have all these attachments to needing to believe because it was associated with my career and my family and my, and my social standing and all of that. I had all these attachments that I needed to believe. I needed to, and at this point I didn't believe, so I was coming back, but I realized there's so many, I looked kind of into this abyss of this infinite question mark. So what is all of this mystery? What are these experiences that I had? And for the first time in my life, I feel like my hands were finally fully open to that mystery, that I didn't have to, 
I didn't need the end of that question to go somewhere for my own ego's sake or for my own life's comfort's sake. And this was the song that came out, a full, open-hearted, open-minded, open-handed, coming back to mystery. It's called Vapor. Oh, the vapor of it all. It's a chasing of the wind, powers of the earth, so pale and thin. I will set my heart on you again. Hold. Trees clap their hands for you, oceans they dance for you, you are holy. Oh, the mystery of it all. Can never peer within, never find the words or understand the fullness of a God becoming man. Holy, all behold the whole. Trees clap their hands for you, oceans they dance for you, you are holy, infinite and holy, a billion suns rise to you, clouds paint the skies for you. Mountains stand tall for you, valleys bow down to you, everything rising to sing all our souls to you.
bring this world to this if you know it you make beautiful things you make beautiful things out of dust you make beautiful things you make beautiful things out of us sing it again just maybe close your eyes for a second and be present in this moment. Be present with your breath. Every breath is gift. Every breath is grace. If you would just kind of rest for a moment. Jesus talked about the yoke being easy and burden being light. And wherever you're at on the path this morning, wherever you're at on your journey, you might be in a really happy, healthy place with the universe, with God, with yourself, where you're just kind of at home. That's fine. I imagine that there's a bunch of you, you know, you're in college, so you're thinking about things, you're asking questions. I imagine that there are some of you that might feel a little unmoored from some of the ways that you grew up, some of your assumptions that you've always held. And it's easy to get anxiety about that, but just for a moment, would you just breathe and be okay with where you're at right now in this place? The word for breath is, the word for spirit is breath, in the old Hebrew language. And we have this breath running through us. We have the very spirit of God holding us together. So just be here and grateful for wherever you're on in your journey and in trusting he who began the work to complete it as it will be. Amen. Thank you for taking that little space. I, my job is making sound and making noise, so whenever I get a chance to create space and not noise, it's nice as well. <laughs> um, I'll do one more song, if that's cool with you guys. Oh, one slight whistle says yes. That's fine. It's just the most... <laughs> that's fine. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, those of you that are around, that have free this evening, please do come out to the Token Show. It's going to be a good time. There's going to there's some tickets. I guess the student government is giving you guys free tickets, which is nice of them or whoever is responsible for that. So you can get some at my merch booth. Is that correct? Anybody? Somebody? Yes. Okay. My merch booth, which is out in the courtyard, and I've got some uh, some things out there. I think I've got. 
I don't have too much with me. We've been doing some stuff. I've, I've got a few books left. We did this, did this project, let me just uh, call it the One Wild Life series. Any One Wild Life listeners out there? Okay, a few casual whistlers as well. And um, we did three records in one year. Uh, that Vapor song was on there, some of the other stuff. And it was, or we released these three records in this one year. That's this craziest thing we've ever done creatively. Super happy with it. I've got, it's just brand new body, just came out this week. It's not even printed in physical format yet. So I actually have a few USBs left that have like the whole project, all three albums on there. You can get those if you'd like. Um, one more song, and then hopefully we'll see you this evening. Thanks again for having me, everybody. Oh, my soul, see, huh? 
Thanks, everybody. It occurs to me that there may be some differences between chapel in 1891 and chapel in uh, 2016. One of the real joys I have is that when I speak before you, Scott McDowell is quick to critique my speech. Uh, so I sat back down a moment ago and he said, hey, you know, you didn't even get the name of the co-founder right. Uh, it's not John Harding, it's James Harding. And Scott is right, it is James Harding, but for those of us who knew him well, it really was John Harding. And then he said, you know, you didn't get much of an ovation with that parking announcement because you said they would be done after spring break. Well, let me correct that. The first 57 spaces will be done after fall break. <laughs> and the next 120 spaces will be done before the fall semester is over. So uh, we are making progress. And now, with the authority of the Board of Trustees invested in me as the president, and in recognition of our founder, David Lipscomb, and his friend, John Harding, <laughs> in celebration of our 125th anniversary, I am pleased to announce that the next two class periods have been canceled. <laughs> and to invite you, to invite you for a celebration of our 125th anniversary with our festival in the park. Thank you, Dr. Lowry. A couple of details about that. Again, 1155 and 120 classes are canceled. Labs are not canceled. 245 classes resume and meet as scheduled. Important, all students with a meal plan. You can use your Lipscomb ID in the buffet lines. All commuter students, faculty, and staff need to tell the cashier their commuter or faculty staff and their meal will be covered. Yeah. Live music, festival games, a dunk tank, and much more in Bison Square. I think that is all, and y'all are dismissed to Bison Square.